Kia ora again. It gives me very great pleasure to welcome the Honourable David Parker, New Zealand's Minister for Trade and Export Growth. In addition to trade, he holds the portfolios of Economic Development, Environment, and he's the Attorney General. So in addition to the economics of trade, he's dealing with issues locally and internationally on, on climate change, which we've just heard about, on the Treaty of Waitangi, which matters domestically, and so on. In recent months, Minister Parker has held talks with UK International Trade Secretary Liz Truss in London to discuss a trade deal between the UK and New Zealand. He's reinforced the importance of New Zealand-Irish partnership through the New Agenda Coalition to combat nuclear proliferation and with, are on the Small Advanced Economies Group, which we've heard the, about the importance of today. And he's continued to advance the EU-New Zealand Free Trade Agreement. And these are just the things that those of us on the outside of MFAT um, can see. Today, we're fortunate enough to get further insights from the inside. So specifically on the challenges and opportunities facing trade in these turbulent times. Please join me in welcoming Honourable David Parker. It's hard for me to get rid of the economic development portfolio. <laughs> Um, uh, kia ora everyone, um, I'm honoured to be here at your first um, dedicated trade and economic policy school on the topics of disruption and disruptors. Um, there's so many aspects to that, um, uh, listening to that, one, if I could just add something to one of the questions that was asked to the panel, uh, in addition to uh, the uh, issue of immigration, I would say one of the other disruptors is social media topic that I might touch on a little, uh, but I think it is one of the causes of this move to populism and this loss of trust in democratic institutions. Uh, anyway, um, earlier this year I spoke at the Foreign Policy School in Otago, uh, uh, and it seems fitting to be here to talk about trade and economic policy in Tamaki Makaurau. Third of the country's population a substantial proportion of New Zealand's trade and tourism at least passes through Auckland, and it's true that a goodly portion of it's generated here. It's also home to New Zealand's largest uh, academic institution, this university. It's where, because of population size, you've got the greatest concentration of NGOs, development agencies, unions, over 20 international business councils, and of course it's going to be home to APEC in just a couple of years' time. So this school's an idea whose time has come and I congratulate the Public Policy Institute of the University who, with support from MFAT, uh, have launched this forum. I can see you've assembled an impressive lineup of local and international speakers, and indeed I found those comments very interesting just a moment ago. <clears throat> it's fantastic to see so many faces in the audience who have long followed these issues, uh, and uh, I'm sure that the... Uh, you know, the level of understanding in these issues here is uh, probably unparalleled to any room you could put together in the country. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge that depth and breadth of experience in the room, uh, recognising the critical role that trade and economic lit policy plays. Um, I trust, given that, that you'll forgive me for at least uh, uh, outlining why trade matters, um, and then I'll turn to the headwinds or disruptions that are causing concern at the moment. As a country just shy of five million people, we're unable to sell domestically what it is that we produce. Uh, at the same time, we want access to the things that give us a good standard of living and quality of life, the smartphones, the cars, the medicines, the foods that we don't produce, bananas. Our exports enable us to pay for our imports and contribute to this uh, standard of living that New Zealanders have become accustomed to. Uh, you'll be familiar with the headline numbers. Uh, exports provide a livelihood for more than 600,000 New Zealanders, which means one in four New Zealanders, uh, New Zealand workers depend on exports for their well-being. Trade's a key contributor to increasing productivity, uh, employment and incomes. We know that New Zealand workers are 34% more productive when working in an export business or in put another way, GDP per employee is 34% higher in export businesses. They earn about 
wages that are about, or salaries that are about 7% higher uh, than others. Trade therefore contributes a great deal to their well-being and our well-being as a country. We're very good at exporting the things we produce. Uh, over the last uh, five years, exports have risen 4.6% uh, per annum on average. Uh, however, as others have said, we need to acknowledge we face uh, significant headwinds globally. After the apparent uh, recovery in the last few years, which saw global growth peak at close to 4% in 2017, the IMF downgraded its global forecasts several times, now to just three, over 3.2% 3 for 2019, and for de developing countries, uh, it's much lower. Now, there's lots of causes of that. Uh, I think one of it is that the recovery that we have actually hasn't been a true recovery. It's been born of quantitative easing, you know, interest rates and uh, you know, historic lows, negative interest rates, having to pay the bank money to store it. Absurd. Um, but it's also true that contributing to the current downgrades is the continuing uncertainty around Brexit, increasingly uh, global trade uh, tensions, and these all contribute to softening global demand. Uh, we've seen recently in the US what the economists call an inverted yield curve, where short-term bond yields are, are, are higher than long-term yields, which often signals trouble brewing. On top of that, we've seen a significant increase in protectionist measures. The WTO's 2018 Trade-Related Developments Report showed that the value of trade covered by import restrictive measures jumped to 588 billion US dollars in the year to uh, October last year. That's more than seven times the measures that were recorded in the previous annual overview. Between October last year uh, and May this year, a further 340 billion US dollars of restricted measures were added. That's nearly a trillion dollars in less than two years. Even more concerning is the increasing resort by uh, major economies to unilateral imposition of not just tariffs, but measures that disrupt global value chains. Global tariffs are rising, and that's not what New Zealand likes to see, dependent as we are on fair and open access to other markets. It's now increasingly clear that there are strong downside risks for the global economy, and these are starting to come through trade figures with uh, trade growth growing. Uh, sorry, tr trade growth slowing. Uh, it's down about a third, that's the rate of growth in trade, which you would expect would roughly follow the rate of growth in the global economy, but it's now slowing. It's 2.5% growth over 2019, a decrease of a third of where it was the year before. Investment flows have dropped by even more. In this more challenging environment, uh, we need a, or we do take a strategic uh, and we think pretty creative approach to trade policy, uh, which we think is vital for a small open economy such as New Zealand. Some of this, uh, some of you will be already familiar with this, uh, and many of you will know that our ability to do this is born of activism in this part of international relations since the 1970s when the, the UK divorced us as they entered into the European community. So we're in a position to do things because of the capability that we have in this area of competency. So what are we doing? First, we're defending the rules-based system centred in the WTO uh, that's so crucial to New Zealand. We're embedding New Zealand in emerging regional economic architecture such as CPTPP. Uh, uh, we're supporting regional and global public goods that contribute to integration and rule-making by being active in organisations like the OECD, <coughs> APEC, uh, the Commonwealth. We're advancing the concept of flexible and open negotiating arrangements again encouraging more rules-based integration via trade agreements. We're developing a trade for all agenda in consultation with New Zealanders and we're int intensifying our economic diplomacy by providing practical support and advice to our exporters as they nav navigate the challenges and opportunities in offshore markets. That's just on the trade front. We've got a lot of allied measures in other areas of, uh, of um, economic policy which I won't talk about. But in respect of those six, I'm going to focus on one of them, which is uh, the Trade for All agenda. Uh, it's one of our responses to the challenges arising from global disruption. 
In recent times, uh, the social compact for trade has frayed, with many questions being asked about the scope, domestic reach and impact of trade and trade agreements. TPP was a fracture point for New Zealand, it was a lightning rod for broad concerns about trade and trade agreements. I don't think all of it arises from trade, even though trade gets uh, the blame for a lot of it. Uh, it goes further than immigration, in my view, with respect to the prior speaker. I think it, a lot of the concerns arise from growing income inequality, uh, growing wealth inequality, which is the compounding effects of that in income inequality over time, multinational tax avoidance, the impact of technology on future employment opportunities and the future of work that causes insecurities, uh, and our, housing costs, our, our high housing costs in New Zealand and the homelessness that we see. It's understandable in this context that people want to understand what's driving these factors, uh, and it's easy to blame trade, uh, because I think for trade, many people see that associated with multinationals, which they in turn associate with really wealthy people, uh, and it's seen as a bit of a proxy for some of the things that are going wrong in the world with this concentration of wealth to the 1%. So it's all the more important that we have outreach that contributes to society's understanding of trade uh, so that they can be assured what the risks are and how they're mitigated. So we're engaging closely with New Zealanders in an effort to understand and respond to their concerns and interests. Trade for All is concerned with sustainable development, supporting New Zealanders in all regions of New Zealand to succeed on, succeed on the global stage, including women, Maori, people in small and medium-sized businesses. Indeed, we, in the latest little sort of reshuffle that we had, Nanaia Mahuta uh, took on a role of responsibility for indigenous trade issues. So we're trying to make these things real. And we believe that trade for all processes will deliver a greater level of understanding about trade in New Zealand. It also provides us a vehicle to hear the concerns that are pressing and respond to them. Ultimately, uh, we intend to announce a trade for all agenda which is developed with New Zealanders for New Zealanders. You'll be aware that we established an independent trade for all advisory board last year to make recommendations for New Zealand's trade policy. It's chaired by David Pine, comprises a wide range of people from New Zealand society bringing different perspectives. The role of the board goes further than just discussing matters around the board table. David and his board have been out taking the temperature on trademark matters, discussing these things with New Zealanders, their concerns and aspirations uh, for trade and trade policy. And we're looking forward to receiving the board's report and recommendations by the end of the year. This will form an important part in the development of trade for all. The name itself is a good example of trade. We appropriated that one rather than traded it with the European Union. <laughs> uh, but we're confident that um, uh, that this will help the process of rebuilding public support for appropriate trade policy. It's not the only um, international trade environment in, in, in the throes of, uh, of uh, it's not only international trade that's in the throes of disruption. The wider economic context is also changing. I think one of the uh, disruptors in society as well as in trade is uh, the digital economy, which is changing the nature of trade and commerce and employment, including an array of opportunities and challenges in the ways in which we you know, previously couldn't have even dreamed of, except in sci-fi novels. They often got it right, actually. Um, but you know, the McKinsey predicts that by uh, between 2030 and 2040, between, uh, that theoretically 60% of the tasks in the New Zealand economy could be automated, and that 30% will be is an astounding statistic. It implies a lot of change. Uh, and that uh, change is reflected in the global economy, which is undermining a digital transformation. The pace of change is uh, perhaps unprecedented with uh, some historical transformations, certainly going back quite a while. It's powered by this convergence of, of uh, affordable computing power uh, these ex exponentially faster computers, new technologies like sensors, uh, robotics, uh, mobile positioning systems, better understandings of genetics unleashed by computing power, uh, the connective power of the internet, uh, which of course is behind big data and uh, the internet of things. 
The volume of data is staggering. It doubles every three years as data pours in from digital platforms, wireless sensors and billions of mobile phones. Now, I've given other, other speeches about the size of the opportunity that's born of these new technologies and how important it is that we harness capital and people into this thriving sector or these thriving sectors uh, of the economy. You know, te te and it's going well in New Zealand. Technology exports are now our third highest uh, source of exports after tourism and primary production. And I don't have to detail time to detail these uh, the challenges and our interventions. Um, some of them are, I think, you know, probably well known, like our recent support of VC markets. Uh, but today I'm going to focus instead on the trade aspects and of the internet and internet commerce. Uh, I, you know, of course, modern economies are no longer as easily defined by geographic borders. I think the US is going to find this out. I'd respectfully suggest that, even if they might like to think that these things can all be onshored or particular other large economies can be um, uh, brought to heel. I'm not sure it's going to play out that way. As part of uh, the global digital economy, this creates uh, exciting new opportunities for countries like New Zealand, both in terms of well-being and economic growth. Uh, Digitalisation has benefits to all uh, citizens, with governments being able to provide more transparent and sometimes more responsible services, leading to better social outcomes. Citizens have greater access to innovative services and things like education and banking. They have a lot more choices. The freer and more rapid circulation of news and ideas on social media platforms is a bit of a two-edged sword. Uh, it can promote uh, social connections. Um, it can support free sport speech and democratic mobilisation, uh, but it also enables the spread of disinformation, hatred and intolerance, uh, leaving people uncertain as to what to believe. Uh, nevertheless, there's no doubt that there's a lot of good things that come out of the internet. Consumers have more choice, lower prices, better information at greater convenience, and businesses are able to easily connect with global markets. You don't need huge institution, institutional form to trade abroad compared with yesteryear. New technologies in combination with big data have the potential to generate breakthroughs of huge significance in the areas of disease and climate change. The disruptive impacts of this on states and society have varied. The harvesting and sale of data by large corporations has uh, raised concerns about privacy, competition, unfair consumer practices, and indeed ele election manipulation. The use of artificial intelligence and algorithms by companies and governments uh, raises the fear of bias, profiling, and human rights abuses. The effect of digital technologies in the workplaces are, uh, raises the specter of change uh, and insecurity for some involved in the gig economy uh, who find themselves uh, insecure. Increased connectivity uh, creates uh, vulnerabilities or it actually creates both vulnerabilities for data and infrastructure, um, but it also uh, means that we need to do harder to protect against those vulnerabilities. This in turn creates some double-edged swords. Encryption is incredibly important, for example, None of us want our banking records to be used by someone else. <laughs> um, uh, but encryption, which is so necessary in commerce, can also make it harder for legitimate law enforcement, even if they get a warrant, uh, uh, if they've got end-to-end -end encryption, uh, then warranted searches can be frustrated by end-to-end -end encryption in a way that wasn't a problem in respect of earlier technologies. So there are some serious um, concerns that arise there. There are also serious concerns around disinformation on internet platforms undermining democratic processes. Uh, we've got extreme assertions uh, and deliberate untruths. This is not, um, and, you know, it seems to me deliberate untruths. So people have got a right to be wrong and hold very strong opinions. But uh, the deliberate promotion of known untruths does undermine public confidence in the democratic institutions. Uh, and it's a somewhat an irony that the, the uh, social media platforms 
uh, are probably doing the opposite of what the fourth estate is meant to do, which is to keep democratic institutions clean. Rather, we've got a method now where people, politicians who are unprincipled, can go direct to the people and spread untruths. And as we saw tragically on March the 15th in Christchurch, digital technologies can be used as weapons of terror. In this act of terrorism, concerted efforts were made to subvert the system by using social media platforms. And these uh, systems, these social media platforms, uh, were used to promote terrorism. Uh, and uh, we've got to do more to, of course, counter terrorist and violent extremism online. So we need to balance all of these opportunities and risks wisely as we look to lead our societies in the digital era. On the one hand, we must take care not to let the causes, let these risks cause us to be unduly hesitant or fearful of digitalization. Indeed, even if we were, we can't avoid it. Technological change is unavoidable, and the opportunities of the digital economy will not be ignored by others, and nor should they be ignored by us. It's too important and the consequences of being left behind in the digital transformation are great. So in developing trade and economic policy in the digital area, we must work with courage to support our businesses and consumers to take advantage of the numerous opportunities that arise. It's fair to say that SMEs, and you know, our SMEs probably benefit more than most countries' SMEs, because on average our small SMEs are smaller, uh, because we're a smaller economy. Uh, and they stand to gain significantly from advancement in this area. Uh, and we need to help by ensuring that we build appropriate skills and capability in our country. At the same time, we must ensure that all of New Zealand, both current and future, are protected and supported through the transformation. This balance is key to our response to the challenge set by digital disruption. Essentially, quality of life and well-being for New Zealanders are the ultimate objectives. Digitalisation is not a, an aim in itself. Better outcomes are. Economic growth is a crucial part of this, but it's not, again, it's not an endpoint in of, of itself. We must keep people at the centre of our thinking as we look to form policy responses to digital transformation. This means that transparency, accountability and human responsibility have got to be at the heart of our approach to new technologies such as artificial intelligence and the use of algorithms. Our approach to data issues and social me media platforms must keep in mind the issues of importance to New Zealand such as privacy, choice, safety, protection of identity, identity and I would add to that protection of democratic institutions. We need to ensure that everyone can share in the opportunities presented by the digital age by supporting people to acquire the skills needed to use it must build resilient, inclusive communities, support the mental health of our populations so that New Zealanders prosper in an environment of increasingly rapid change and complexity. If our response to digital transformation is to work, we must also recognise that more than ever we're operating in a connected global context. The economy is the digital economy and that digital economy is increasingly a global digital economy. Many of the issues we face are global in nature and some require an international approach or response. Different countries will of course have different approaches to responses to these issues based on their assessment of their national needs and their own context. Divergent approaches to, global, uh, to these digital issues um, will be, they, you know, they're, they're, I think some diversity of response is actually desirable, but it can also be abused uh, and can reduce connectivity can cause fragmentation and significantly affect uh, the integration of the digital economy. And we're seeing uh, examples of this in countries' uh, different approaches to the storage of data. We must recognise that in this digital age, uh, nation states aren't the only significant actors on the international stage, but they still have a very important role. Uh, large multinational technology companies now have such global reach and market power that they've got considerable influence over many facets of the lives of populations around the world. It's not to say that governments shouldn't be pushing against excesses in that regard and protecting some sort of data and requiring some sort of data to be stored locally. We're not, we're not going that far. 
Uh, but we must also take care to champion free, open societies, democracy. And we think a secure and open internet uh, is important, not just for the digital economy, but we think it's beneficial to the world. This doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that those who cause or profit from harm shouldn't have responsibilities. It's a different issue. We shouldn't, well, it's a related issue, but we shouldn't say that just because we need a free, open and secure internet that those who cause harm or profit from, uh, from harm shouldn't bear some responsibility. We must contribute in the key international fora to ensure that rules develop in a way that allows countries to design policy according to their own national needs, but avoids destructive fragmentation of systems that would otherwise operate for global benefit. We must build constructive, productive relationships with the relevant non-state international actors to ensure that any such rules or approaches can be effective in practice. How do we achieve these things for New Zealanders in an increasingly turbulent environment where the rules-based multilateral system is under threat and our normal means of influence and control aren't as effective as they used to be? Well, we do what we always have done. We try to be constructive, we're creative, we find like-minded countries, we build consensus and alliances, and we involve ourselves in the many processes that set the rules and norms of behaviour that we want to see in the world. We do this in established fora such as the WTO and APEC, and we find new fora such as the Christchurch call and our negotiations towards a digital economic partnership agreement, which has been, was launched on the margins of APEC last year, and it's very kind of Van Gallis to give me credit for that, but I was just the puppet. <laughs> DEPA brings together New Zealand, Chile and Singapore. As small trade dependent countries, these three countries traditionally have much in common in terms of strategic alignment on trade policy issues. We were three of the four countries uh, to initiate and of course create the P4 agreement which set the scene for the eventual CPTPP. So we're pretty good at this stuff. And together we're exploring what we can do with Chile and Singapore uh, to be able to agree terms or principles, rules for cooperation and digital trade in the digital economy. We're looking at newer issues like digital identity, artificial intelligence, electronic invoicing and open data. We want to make it easier for businesses and consumers to take advantage in the opportunities of, of digital trade. Um, we don't, we don't, we don't, you know, we're not going to We've also got to protect privacy, uh, privacy interests, and indeed in that, in that arena I think that the leader of, in, in the world in this at the moment is the European Union, but uh, of the countries that they recognise as having comparative or comparable rules for data protection, they actually identify New Zealand as one of the outstanding proponents of a principle-based approach to privacy issues. We want to make it easier uh, for businesses and consumers to take advantage of the opportunities of digital trade. Uh, we're absolutely determined to ensure interests of importance to all New Zealanders, such as the protection of personal privacy and data management are protected. We want to see what may be possible by way of the Pathfinder Agreement to help shape an emerging area of national, international trade policy. We want to generate new ideas and approaches that can be used in WTO negotiations by other countries that are negotiating their own free trade agreements, or by engaging in the international digital economy and trade work in the likes of APEC, OECD, or even the Commonwealth. Above all, we want to help shape the institutions and rules for the digital economy and not have major economies oppose less fair rules upon us. DEPA is part of our strategy towards that end. So, New Zealand, like the rest of the world, faces significant disruption. Uh, some of it's technological, some of it's political. Uh, in these turbulent times, however, our willingness to find clear and constructive solutions guided by our clear strategy and our adherence to our principles and our reputation for being willing to adhere to our principles even when it doesn't make us popular, uh, I think you know, stands us in good stead. Thanks very much.
Uh, kia ora. Sorry, Minister, but I have to ask you this. <laughs> White tangy clothes? No. If data is so important and is going to be such a great um, uh, leadership, um, such great evidence of New Zealand's leadership in the future, why is it being negotiated in secret? Uh, well, it's hardly stopped being started being negotiated. Uh, do you want to isn't, isn't it supposed to be concluded in November? Uh, no, I don't think it'll be completely finished by November, will it, Vangelis? Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I, I had to get the information on what's happening in it from the Chilean government, which released it to their stakeholders, and there has been no information here. So whilst I hear what you're saying about the, well, well, this government taking on board concerns that have been about these agreements, there are still some very big, deep black holes that need to be filled. Well, I actually think that's a fair criticism, Jane. So, you know, I'll, uh, I'll undertake, if, you, if, you've, if you've not been involved in any outreach in respect of that, because although I don't agree with you on everything, you, she, ha she has, as well, you have, I'm told. Yeah. yeah. So indeed, um, when the negotiation was launched earlier this year, um, public submissions were called for at that time. Uh, the website contains the negotiating mandate, which you're aware of. Um, obviously some parts are redacted because it is a negotiating mandate. It has a detailed list of frequently asked questions and it is publicly available. Um, it has just been updated again uh, and it includes the material that you've just referred to um, that the uh, the detail of the issues that we're covering, and of course there's a contact point, uh, and of course there have been public uh, sessions as well as uh, meetings with individuals and groups uh, as well. Sorry that I forgot that close date, uh, but Jane, I, 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 you know, I actually do recognise that you've been following these uh, 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 electronic data issues and have concerns about that, and. Uh, I'm certainly open to receiving your views, uh, uh, as I'm sure Vangelis is. Um, um, well, if it was a broader point and an example, well, I think Vangelis has tried to answer that by saying that there is a level of transparency around it that might not satisfy everyone, but it's more than nil. Are we going to make that date? <laughs> Are we going to make that date? <laughs> sure. I'll just borrow this. So as a political scientist rather than an economist, I, I'm I'm really pleased to hear your conversations about um, the need for thinking about deliberate untruths and how to manage that. And so I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about the intersection of trade and democracy or accountability and those aspirations that you have to protect us from deliberate untruths and weapons of terror. Um, well, a lot of it's informal. You know, I... I um I, in my role, meet a lot of politicians from other countries, and we're all talking about this stuff. We're also, at one level, scared to talk about this stuff. Uh, well, not that's not the right phrase, but we're also hesitant to uh, to to go too far because um, uh, uh, the the debate, in my opinion, is too easily characterised as being either in favour of a completely free and open internet without responsibility on those causing harm compared with uh, autocracy that suppresses freedom of expression. Uh, and uh, uh, politicians around the world are, I think, uh, quite deep thinkers about these issues, uh, even if the public discourse is somewhat on, like in a lot of other political arenas, superficial. Um, and that, that that debate is getting resonance around the world. I've seen it change in the last couple of years in my travels. And indeed, Vernon and I were just sharing a, um, an article 
uh, in The Guardian this week by someone who said, uh, and correct me if I've got this phrase wrong, Vernon, but said the problem is not uh, freedom of speech, it's freedom of responsibility for speech. That was essentially what was uh, the, um, the, the, the topic. Uh, and they were saying that there's this myth perpetrated that uh, um, limits to lack of responsibility for speech, or oh, sorry, limits to uh, n none of, you and I, if I was to defame anyone in this room, I would have responsibility for it. So do newspapers, so does the television and the radio. But some of the current uh, methods of distribution have no such responsibility. Now it's a very difficult issue because no one wants to kill off the internet. Um, but um, uh, I think there's growing concern uh, at a lot of different levels. I was at a dinner last night with a group of people and a, uh, a woman who's a senior businesswoman was noting the uh, effect of the uh, uh, the state of social media platforms on her children. So parents have concern about the effect on their children. I have concerns about the effect on democratic institutions uh, and just trust in society. Uh, the erosion of trust that people have in each other is not, is not a good thing. So uh, I, I, I don't pretend to, uh, well I actually do have opinions as to what the answers are, but it's an, it's an area where we have to take considerable care that we um, um, progress slowly to the right, or progress methodically to the right conclusions uh, and have a debate within society as to what people think is the proper balance in today's world between freedom of expression and responsibility for harm through through, um, as you say, deliberate disinformation, some of which is spread by state actors, uh, some of which is just you know, by people who are trying to, uh, uh, you know, political parties trying to promote their own viewpoints and others uh, by, you know, ideologues who think that the ends justifies the means. Thank you very much, Minister. I enjoyed your speech very much and uh, all of the topics that you covered in detail and with, with great uh, with insights. And uh, I think uh, I'd like to commend New Zealand on its very progressive and outward-looking trade policy, which has always been, I think, a leader in this field. So that's wonderful. I have one question, and I'd like, I don't know, and I think it would be helpful. Um, I hope you don't mind if I ask it. In, in the United States, we know that, well, to preface this, we know that some of the major changes in our economies are being driven by technology, as you said, and that technology is actually responsible for about 80% of our loss of jobs. It's not trade, even though trade is often designed and, and indicated as the culprit. In the United States, um, the trade adjustment assistance that exist is actually linked to the loss of jobs due to trade and not to technology changes in general. So as you can imagine, the use of this is actually very limited and the adjustment it provides for people who lose jobs is therefore very limited. And I just, as in New Zealand, do you have an adjustment assistance program that is very broadly designed in terms of ability to, to retrain those who do lose their jobs primarily from technology changes, and do you use this and design this in such a way as to try to uh, bring them into more digital economy and to jobs that are more applicable for the digital economy? Well, for, for a start, our, our social assistance is, is uh, whilst not perfect, is more generous than some other countries, and it's not time limited. We don't have time limited benefits. Um, uh, so it's a, it is already a substantial safety net, um, it, it doesn't preserve pre-unemployment um, uh, income. It's set at a very modest level, uh, but it is universal and uh, universally available and uh, long-term. Uh, 
But we're trying, we, we, we as a country, we, we're pretty good at planning for these events, if I do say so myself, uh, over the, through the decades. And we've got a big work program going on the future of work at the moment. And that, that's got a number of parts. It's got a tripartite forum which brings together capital, labour and government. Uh, and we talk these issues through. Uh, we receive uh, presentations from people who have got ideas as to what need to be done to, uh, to maximise opportunities and deal with those who are affected by the disruption or deal, you know, help people who are affected by the disruption. Uh, and the, I think the thing that has stood out to me uh, most in respect of, I sit on that committee and I also sit on a, 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 a meetings with the Business Advisory Council, which is a group of um, uh, business, businesses who provide an, a, an advice stream to government. Uh, and I think both of those bodies would, uh, were, were struck with the same thing that was a zing moment for me, which is that uh, the key to, uh, or one, probably the most important key to avoiding uh, the income disparity growing wider in societies as a consequence of the digital disruption of so many tasks, which flows through to a lot of jobs, is on the work training. And the reason for that is that the uh, change that comes affects mostly people who are already in employment. Uh, and uh, the predicted shape of the future job market is that there are an increasing number of low paid or low skilled jobs. There are an increasing number of high skilled jobs, at least for the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, and there are de decreasing numbers of middle income jobs. Uh, and the effect of that is if you don't train the people who are in the middle to take the high skilled jobs, you become more reliant on immigration uh, and you also have increasing returns to skill because you have a shortage of skill uh, in respect of that larger number of skilled jobs. Uh, you also have increasing competition for jobs at the lower end of the labour market. So unless you retrain your existing workforce, particularly in the middle income jobs, you have increasing returns to skill and increasing competition at the bottom and you have increasing divergence of income between high earners and low earners and therefore you have an increasing Gini coefficient. And uh, McKinsey has done some work on this for these bodies, uh, born of um, work that they've done overseas as well. Uh, and I thought that that was, a, that was, a, that was a, an absolutely important point because they essentially say to avoid that bad outcome, you've got to have the opposite. You've got to have on-the-job training for people who, uh, whose jobs are going to change. And in order to achieve that, you have to have risk sharing between government and employers to achieve that outcome because without that risk sharing, you won't get it. Now, we've got, we've got some, as a consequence of these things and other things, we've got very big program of work to, to reform vocational education, which hasn't been working well in New Zealand. Uh, uh, and we're also uh, looking at mechanisms to encourage employers to do that. Some of them are voluntary. Uh, as a consequence of these initiatives, we've got a large number of employers already pledging to increase the number of their people that they are uh, retraining on, on the job. So that's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a joint initiative, but there's no compulsion about it. But there are there need to be other mechanisms that ac that actually share risk as well, and some of those will come from immigration settings. Uh, one of the routes through uh, 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 agreements with uh, industries will be through industry transformation plans, uh, uh, which is, again it's, it's a concept that's been well developed by Singapore, one of our partners, and we think can be adapted to New Zealand's circumstance. So it's a very long answer, but it's actually it's an incredibly important topic. And my own opinion is that that uh, retraining of the existing workforce is absolutely crucial. Oh, here. Okay, I thought he was going to go first. <laughs> um, so. My question is uh, about whether the disruption which is coming um, from the U.S. has accelerated or hindered 
liberalization in the rest of the world. Uh, as a trade minister, do you feel that in the last couple of years, this disruption has made third countries more likely to liberalize or less likely to liberalize? What's your view? Well, for a start, I wouldn't blame the US. Uh, I'd be careful not to blame them. There are considerable areas of disquiet that the US has about the multilateral system being held hostage by one side or another that we agree with, and there are problems with the appellate body that we agree with them on. Uh, and uh, some of the issues that uh, politicians in the US are grappling with are also borne by events that the US is not responsible for, so I'm, I'm not going to, uh, uh, to blame the US. Um, uh, in terms of uh, whether you, if you have a rise of protectionism, does it breed more? Yes. Does intolerance breed intolerance? Yes. Uh, are we seeing that in the rest of the world? Yes. Uh, across many countries, and um, and not just in relation to trade, actually. Um, there's some pretty stern things being said between countries that perhaps used to be cast more diplomatically and helpfully in yesteryear. Hello. That's Hello. Uh, Tēnā koe, Minister. Uh, my question is around the Māori economy. Um, what impact, if any, do you see of increasing Māori trade having on the New Zealand Inc. positions and on trade agreement negotiation, including potentially in future Indigenous intellectual property requirements around protection of it? Um, I actually don't think that we need to change our trade agreements at all in order to achieve those outcomes. Um, I think they're already well protected under the clauses of our existing agreements. Indeed, it's, it's interesting for me that uh, successive governments have been rather slow to implement the recommendations of the Waitangi Tribunal around Indigenous knowledge in Y262. And the trigger for that actually being brought to a head and forcing New Zealand to do that has actually been CPTPP. So CPTPP has both protected our ability to do it properly, but has also included requirements that we update our intellectual property re um, uh, regime, including considering UPOV, what's, what's, has it got a number of it? UPOV 91, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, and we, we should do so. Thank you, I've got another question. Yep. Um, what do you think the impact of digital commerce will be on um, increasing Māori trade? Um, I don't know that it'll be all that, well actually maybe, you know, I don't know that it'll be overall all that different to, uh, to other sectors of society, uh, but maybe, um, uh, maybe we've got. We, we, maybe we can actually hit through that help both ourselves and indigenous populations in other countries through utilising digital platforms to have bilateral relationships with other indigenous populations, um, um, uh, uh, which would be a good thing for because most other countries have similar stats relating to social deprivation of their indigenous populations, just as we do. Uh, and uh, you know, good could come of that. Uh, one area that s springs to mind is um, we know that Mexico have got uh, they've got some amazing bees uh, and uh, honey that has uh, 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 historical or is thought to have medicinal uh, properties that go back a long time, and they've never proved them up. Uh, and uh, you know, we can help them do that. Uh, um, but these things have to work for both sides. If that didn't work for some benefit for the indigenous traders from New Zealand going there, well, they wouldn't stick at it all that long or put as much effort into it as it might need. So it's, you know, it's, it's got to work for both sides. Hi, good evening. I was just wondering for you as Minister, what does success look like? Is there a key, maybe one or two things that you'd like to achieve why you have this portfolio? Um, I'm, 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 quite, um, I'm quite pleased that we responded to uh, disquiet over ISDS clauses. Um, and I see that as a, uh, 
Uh, actually, I'll put it the other way. I've actually been pleased that trade has proven to be a vector to have a conversation about inequality in New Zealand and around the world because I believe that this rapid concentration of wealth to the 1% is one of the worst things that is happening in the world. Um, so I, I, like, I actually like that aspect of trade and I really, I really I'm pleased that I think there is an awakening to the need for inclusivity around trade that doesn't just relate to gender, important though it is, or indigeneity, which is also important, but it actually relates to inequality, wealth inequality. Uh, and uh, so I'd, I'd like to use our uh, place in the world to push that along as an issue. Uh, the second issue uh, relates to uh, environmental outcomes, although I am aware that it's unrealistic to expect trade agreements to do through uh, enforceable, enforceable mechanisms what the environmental agreements themselves cannot achieve. Uh, but within the constraints of what is possible to achieve, I, uh, I think it's really good to push those issues. Uh, you know, you'd be amazed at the number of people who are shocked when I look at them in the eye and say, I'm confident that New Zealand by 2050 will be using virtually no fossil fuels, because that sure as hell ain't their worldview. Um, but it's, you know, the, the fact that we're on that transition in New Zealand, 85% renewables, electricity, you know, don't need really any new technologies to generate more electricity, just need a bit of hydrogen there to drive heavy transport. Um, uh, if you, you know, assuming the batteries can't do the task, you know, we, we're, we're, we're well on the way there, so we tell a, tell a good story about that, which is a hopeful story in the world. And, um, you know, as Environment Minister, I've got to say, I'm pretty depressed about the news that we see every week in the papers about some other ecological catastrophe. And it's good to have points of hope in the world that people can rally around. And I think, I think we, we do that well. So those would be the two points I'd make. Hey, can I apologise by for my error early? I hate making mistakes like that. So. Close date for. Anyway, um, we're closing now, and we're off to our reception, which um, is just out here and up the stairs into the business school atrium, where you can imbibe some nice food and drink for an hour or so and listen to some music. Um, and so I would just say in advance of closing this evening that we have to be back here bright and early for Professor Richard Baldwin's talk. We're kicking off at 8.30 tomorrow morning, so, you know, try and get here all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for that. But in the meantime, can I ask you in joining with me to thank Minister Parker. <laughs>